People who do possibility studies, mathematicians, have written about what would the odds be of 48 of these prophecies being fulfilled in exact detail. And the number that they came up with is not possible for me to say. I can't even describe it. Here's the take on it. It's more than the entire atoms on the earth. Not people, atoms. In other words, it is absolutely impossible that this could have happened and this could have happened and it not be the miraculous hand of God in the middle of it all. Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah. There isn't any question about it. Any thinking person, any honest, reasonable person who goes to the study of it will come away not doubting, but with their hands up high in faith. The Old Testament men and women is packed with information about Jesus Christ. There are more than 300 specific predictions about his first coming in the Old Testament scriptures. There are types or pictures of him in the Old Testament. Sometimes he shows up in the Old Testament. It's called a theophany, the personal presence of Jesus before he was born in Bethlehem. When you read the Old Testament with Jesus in mind, everything is different. Everything is totally revised, and you see that these are not just a collection of stories, but these are preparing you to know Jesus who's about to be introduced in the New Testament as he comes to this earth. Is Jesus in the Old Testament or in the New? He's in both. But primarily, he's in the Old Testament, and that's what we may not know about Jesus. First of all, I want to introduce you to the first presentation of the gospel in the entire Bible. Now, if I ask you where that is, you probably would say, oh, it's probably John 3.16 or Matthew. No, it's not there. It's not Isaiah. It's not the Psalms. It's not the historical books but it's in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Theologians call this verse the Proto-Evangelium. Proto means first, Evangelium means gospel. They call Genesis 3, 15, the first gospel. As you know, the Bible begins with the book of Genesis and the story of God's creation, his universe, his planet, and the two people that he put on this earth, Adam and Eve. He created them for fellowship with himself, and you know the story of how they violated his command and they sinned, and the punishment came. It was a sad day for all of us when the apple was eaten by Adam and Eve. But here's what I want you to know. God never gave up on them. When they were thrown out of the garden, Almighty God had a talk with Satan. And in Genesis 3.15, here are the words that God said to Satan. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now that sounds like a code. That sounds like a foreign language, like what in the world does that mean? Some people miss this and miss the blessing of it. Take this little phrase, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, this is a very interesting little study, so look down in your Bible, and let me ask you this question. Is the word he capitalized? Come on now, is it? All right. Look down in the next phrase, and you shall bruise his heel. Is the word his capitalized? So who do you suppose that might be? That's Jesus. So listen, here's, here's what this means. God told Satan that one day a seed of the woman, who is that? That's Jesus, born of a woman. One day a seed of the woman is coming, and Satan, you will bruise his heel. But don't get all excited, Satan, because one day he's going to bruise your head. When Jesus was born and came into this world, he went to the cross, and Satan bruised his heel. Satan thought he had won. He was dancing on top of the tomb, and he thought that it was over, but he didn't take Jesus out. He just bruised his heel. The Scripture says one day when Jesus comes the second time, he's going to bruise Satan's head, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly, Romans 16, 20. 
So what God said to Satan was, there's coming someone born of a woman who is going to take you out of the picture and make it impossible for you to control the destiny of my children. There is coming someone as early as the Garden of Eden, this message was spoken. There is coming someone born of the seed of a woman who will stand between you, Satan, and humanity. You will hurt this someone in the heel, but he will crush your head. And when you come to the New Testament with this in the back of your mind, you read Galatians chapter 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. I wish I could spend more time going because this is such a rich yet sometimes totally misunderstood passage. Genesis 3.15 is one of the most encouraging verses in the Bible because here is the first promise of the gospel. Here we see Jesus who's going to come and defeat Satan and bring us back to the family of God. Genesis 3.15 is about Jesus. Jesus in the Old Testament. And then you come to the book of Exodus and you meet another person who is a picture of Jesus. We call this person the Passover lamb. God's plan of redemption continues to unfold. And here we have one of the Bible's greatest types. In the Old Testament, in the early chapters of Exodus, we have the story of Pharaoh and Moses. And you remember the contest between Pharaoh and Moses that resulted in many plagues that were leveled against the Egyptians. But the worst of all the plagues, which was so bad it can even hardly be called a plague, was when the Lord God, after all of the resistance on the part of Pharaoh, said, on this particular night, the death angel is going to pass through Egypt, and the firstborn of every one of your families is going to be slain. But Moses told the Israelite families who lived in Egypt to take a spotless lamb and brush its blood on the doorposts and lintels of their houses. Here's how it reads in Exodus chapter 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. The Lord was simply revealing through this Old Testament story his pattern and his plan. Our salvation from death requires the sacrifice and blood of an innocent lamb. And 1,400 years later, when John the Baptist introduced the Messiah to the world, this is what he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Just as the Lamb of God in the Old Testament was that which enabled the death angel to pass over the houses of the Israelites who displayed the blood on their doorpost, so the blood of the Lamb of God who was slain on Calvary, when it is applied to our hearts, keeps us from the judgment against us because of our sin, and we are redeemed. In the Old Testament, he's the Passover Lamb. In the New Testament, He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Here's the third one. Jesus, the bronze serpent. The book of Numbers describes one of the most vivid symbols of Christ in the Old Testament. Moses had, I think, the hardest job anybody has ever had because Israel kept getting themselves in trouble. They'd get in trouble. God would send some punishment to them. They'd get all right with God, and they'd come back, and they'd walk with God for a while. Then before you know it, there they go again. It's just one story after the other. And don't look so surprised, because it sounds like our story, doesn't it? Well, in the book of Numbers, in the 21st chapter, Israel's in a lot of trouble. They've done some very bad things. Don't have time to go into all the detail. But God was fed up with it. And so he sent some punishment to get their attention. Now, ladies, you might want to close your ears when I say it. He sent them snakes. The Bible calls them serpents, but they're just snakes. Mean, ugly snakes. Snakes everywhere in Israel. 
and they were poisonous snakes, and if you got bit by one of these snakes, you just, was it, you are done. Nothing to do but die. And Moses pled with God. Moses felt responsible for the fact that the people were sinning. He begged God to take this plague from his people. And God spoke to Moses and told him, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on the standard, and it came about that if a serpent bit anyone in the camp, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. You say, well, pastor, what does that mean? Why don't we ask Jesus? Jesus explained it in John 3, 14 and 15. This is what he said. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The people in the wilderness looked to the serpent and they were healed. And when you and I look to Jesus on the cross, when we feel the regret and pain of what we have done and our sinful choices, the, the remedy is never to try to heal ourselves. The remedy is simply to look to Jesus and accept what he's done on the cross, to look to the cross and say, I know you're there for me. You paid the penalty for my sin. And when we look to the cross, it has the same effect upon us as what happened in the Old Testament when those who had been bitten by the serpent looked to the serpent on the pole and they were healed. It's a perfect illustration of Jesus. And where is it? It's in Numbers chapter 21. That's in the Old Testament. That's Jesus in the Old Testament. And then number four, there's Jesus, the forsaken Savior. In Psalm 22, the psalmist describes the crucifixion. I want you to just think about this for a moment. I wish we could open our Bibles and go through all the different verses, but let me just give you the gist of it, and you can write it down in your notes. In Psalm 22, we have a prediction of the words that Jesus would say while he was dying on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22, verse 1. In Psalm 22, we have a description of the nature of his suffering and death, verse 7. In Psalm 22, we have the exact words that were flung at him by the bystanders at the cross. In Psalm 22, we have the story of the dehydration and loss of bodily fluids that were involved in his terrible death at crucifixion. In Psalm 22, we have a history of the disjointed position of his body. In Psalm 22, we have a record of his intense thirst. In Psalm 22, we have a record of the piercing of his hands and feet. In Psalm 22, we have the unclothed state of his body in death. In Psalm 22, we have the gambling away of his garments by the executioners. In Psalm 22, we have his declaration of victory at the resurrection. Ladies and gentlemen, Psalm 22 was written 1,000 years before Jesus died on the cross. Even more amazing is, when Psalm 22 was written, crucifixion was unknown in the world. Crucifixion didn't come until 500 years later. Crucifixion is the most cruel kind of execution. And in the days before the Romans had power, crucifixion was not used. And when David wrote this, 1,000 years before it happened on Mount Calvary, there wasn't even any knowledge of crucifixion, and yet David described it literally in a psalm that was written 10 centuries before it actually happened. You ask me why I believe in Jesus. It's not because I have this wonderful emotional feeling in my heart. I've done a little work I realize that this Jesus that I put my faith in is worthy of my trust, not just because I'm a man of faith. I also happen to be a man of evidence, and the evidence for Jesus is so powerful that any thinking person who would religiously study it would have to come away with the realization that this is unlike anything there is in the history of the world. 
He's the seed of the woman. He's the Passover lamb. He's the fiery serpent. He's the forsaken savior. And he's the suffering servant. Now let's pass from Psalms to the prophet Isaiah. The book of Isaiah is replete with the message of Jesus, the information about his coming. Let's just stop for a moment and think about Christmas, if you will. In the book of Isaiah, the Messiah is to be born of a virgin. He will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. He will come from Galilee. He will be born a child, a son. He will be the Prince of Peace who will inherit the throne of his father, David. He will be anointed by the Holy Spirit. He will possess remarkable traits of character and personality and do something so extraordinary on a mountain that the shroud of death covering all nations will be destroyed. Isaiah wrote all about his birth 700 years before he was born. And when you come to the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, you have the story again of his crucifixion. You know these words, let me read them. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah wrote those words as if he were standing at the end of history and it had already happened. All these words are in the past tense. He's not saying here he will do this. He's saying he has done this. Isaiah stood in his prophetic role at the end of history and said, before it ever happened, this is what's going to happen to the Lord Jesus Christ. The entire 53rd chapter of Isaiah contains a picture of Jesus Christ so vivid and so detailed that it's difficult to conceive that it was written seven centuries before Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. Many scholars have said Isaiah 53 is the most important chapter in the Old Testament because here we have the prophet telling us about the Savior. We have his prophecy 700 years before. Then we have the record of what happened, which has been attested to by secular historians. If a man 700 years before he was born had this prophesied about him, and everything was perfectly fulfilled. I don't mean almost, or he just almost did this. Every one of these prophecies were fulfilled to the exact degree. People who do possibility studies, mathematicians, have written about what would the odds be of 48 of these prophecies being fulfilled in exact detail. And the number that they came up with is not possible for me to say. I can't even describe it. Here's the take on it. It's more than the entire atoms on the earth. Not people, atoms. In other words, it is absolutely impossible that this could have happened and this could have happened and it not be the miraculous hand of God in the middle of it all. Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah. There isn't any question about it. Any thinking person, any honest, reasonable person who goes to the study of it will come away not doubting, but with their hands up high in faith. The God who put that all together in Isaiah and in the New Testament was none other than the God you and I worship, and his son is Jesus Christ. So when we look at these things from the Old Testament, what do we learn? How do we process this in our own daily lives? First of all, when you do this, this little routine, this little study that we've done today, what happens is you strengthen your faith. You know, I'm getting so tired of people saying, oh, you Christians, you believe anything. Somebody tells you to believe it, and you believe it. No, I don't believe anything. I believe what the Bible says, and I've done some homework to find out that what the Bible says is not just true because it says it's true. It's true because it's been proven to be true. The Bible tells you the truth. And this Jesus, who is the miracle out of this process, is the Jesus who says to you and me, 
I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. We may not like that. We may think that's pretty exclusive, but it's true. If Jesus could do what he did in the old and the new, he proves who he is, and that gives me such great comfort. When I have a doubt, when I have a concern about my faith, as we all do on occasion, one of the best things you can do is go back and read Psalm 22, and when you get done with that, go read Isaiah 53 and realize that was written 1,000 years and 700 years before it ever happened in the New Testament. So knowing Jesus from the Old Testament reassures our faith, and it revives our hearts. Do you remember um, when the two disciples went on this walk on the road to Emmaus? It was after Jesus died on the cross, and these two guys were going from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and on the way, they were talking with each other about how disappointed they were because they thought Jesus was going to be their king. And all of a sudden, somebody started walking along with them. This is one of my favorite stories in the New Testament. And they didn't know who it was. But the, the Bible actually says that Jesus caught up with them, and he got in step with them. So now they're having this conversation, Jesus walking along with them. They're talking about how they had hoped that Jesus was going to be the one who would relieve them from their bondage. And the one they were talking about was walking along with them. And they didn't know it. And finally, they get to the turnoff to go to their house, and they go to their house, and the Bible says that when they were breaking the bread, in the breaking of the bread, they realized who it was who had been. God's love is not about warm thoughts and well wishes. It's expressed through action, through actually being kind. It's expressing God's love through our daily attitudes and actions. We keep it fervent. We keep it hard for the devil to blow his cold breath over our heart by doing the works that God calls us to do. That's the spirit I'm recommending. Those of us who know God have embraced his love, and we have to resist the urge to just become complacent and to say, oh, this world is going to hell in a handbasket. There's nothing I can do. Get me some food for this week. Close the door and lock it. I'm going to just be my, you know what? The Bible teaches us that these things that are happening are happening not to make us feel better, but to make us be better. And I don't know about you, I have a passion in my heart. I want to be better. I want to be better for God. I want to know him better. So embrace God's kindness in your heart. Express his kindness. Gates, it is felt to many of us that our culture has been sliding down a slippery slope or perhaps even running headlong off a cliff. There are days when it feels like the whole world is upside down, even lawless. And it's tempting to respond with anger and despair, apathy, as we struggle to comprehend what we can and cannot do to stem the tide. But God calls us to something greater. Hello, I'm David Jeremiah. And in today's message entitled, In a World of Lawlessness, Be Kind, will study Jesus' counter-cultural instructions to his followers. We'll discover how, into this cold and cynical world, we can carry the flame of truth and the fire of God's relentless love and grace. That kind of radical love is possible, and it changes everything. So please join me as we study together on today's edition of Turning Point. A rising star on Afghanistan's national soccer team. He spent hours practicing every day trying to emulate his hero, Argentinian footballer Lionel Messi. He couldn't get enough, said his older brother. It's all he ever talked about. It's all he did. He was born after September the 11th, so he didn't remember the brutal state of the Taliban or the early chaos of the war in Afghanistan. He grew up in Kabul and relative peace and prosperity thanks to the presence of American forces there. When President Joe Biden announced that he would withdraw U.S. troops from Afghanistan in August of 2021, Zaki felt apprehensive. He had heard reports of the Taliban heading toward Kabul, and as the Afghan resistance collapsed, he feared for his family, he feared for his future, but most of all, he grieved the loss of becoming a soccer star. The Taliban banned most sports. Instead of rounding up young men for sports, they forced them to participate in the religious rituals and live under strict control. 
It was on August 16th that Zaki went to the international airport with his older brother and a cousin who had worked for the American company to attempt to secure passage out of Afghanistan. There had already been one suicide bombing in the city. People were beginning to feel panicked. The Taliban forces were close, nearly surrounding the city. The U.S.-backed government was showing more and more signs of imminent collapse. And the plan was for Zaki to watch the car while the older men negotiated, but Zaki couldn't wait. He jumped the fence and entered the airport. And it's not clear what happened next, but at some point he made his way onto the tarmac as a U.S. Air Force C-17 prepared to take off. He ran toward the plane. He raced alongside the aircraft. He was knocked off balance and fell under the wheel. Among his final known words were, pray for me, I'm going to America. But he never made it. He was killed in the accident. And the question that comes to our mind when we hear a story like that, we're not surprised because we watched it. We saw it on TV. Why would anyone run alongside an airplane as it's taking off? Why would anybody do that? And the only reason they would do it is out of desperation. Rising terror in the heart, lawlessness, violence, chaos, brutality. Any of those words will do, and all of them describe our world today. We see it most vividly in our failed states, such as Yemen and Somalia and Syria, and yes, Afghanistan, where law and order have collapsed and extremists fill the void, fomenting hatred and exporting terror. It's difficult for you and me to understand the gruesome life that befalls people that don't live in a place like we do. Most of us in America and the West, we, we feel relatively safe. We elect leaders who say they're gonna uphold the law. <laughs> We have law enforcement agencies and emergency response systems populated by millions of good and decent people. But something is changing. Our police officers have been so vilified by the media that they're finding it hard to do their jobs. Politicians curb law enforcement budgets and prosecutors release people who are arrested the next day. With open borders, it's difficult to control human smugglers and sex traffickers and dangerous drugs. Our Western nations have become so divided that we never know what's going to happen next. What will provoke rioting in our streets and violence in our neighborhoods? What is happening to us? The answer is just what Jesus said would happen in his discourse with his disciples. Listen to his words in the 12th verse of Matthew 24 because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. All you have to do is watch the news every single day. There's something on the news about lawlessness, about the law no longer being obeyed, about people no longer paying a penalty for their crimes, scenes of terrible things happening. Oh, you say, Pastor Jeremiah, there's always been, yes, that's true. We've always had people that want to break the law, but we've always had people that stood behind the law and made sure if they did, they paid a penalty for it. Today, the law means almost nothing in some places. And that people are being more and more liberated to do whatever they want to do without penalty. Jesus said that in the days before I return, lawlessness will abound and the love of many will grow cold. Let's talk for just a moment about this world of lawlessness. If you remember the birth pangs principle where things start and then they get more intense and they get more close together, that's kind of what happens. Lawlessness starts and then it becomes more lawlessness and more lawlessness closer together and more intense lawlessness. So you ask yourself, what's going on in our world? What's going on in our world is sin is just exploding everywhere. And we have no answer to that apart from the forgiveness of Almighty God. We have no way to curb that with our plans and our policies. We curb it over here and it breaks out over here. Because the issue isn't what people are doing, the issue is why they're doing it. Because we're broken and we're sinful. And without the forgiveness of God to make us whole again, We do these things that we can't explain. Jesus knew that. Look again at Matthew 24, 12. He said, lawlessness will abound and the love of many 
will grow cold. And the Bible says wickedness will increase. When Jesus said that, he was describing more than the absence of laws or law enforcement. His words call to mind periods of human history that were defined by chaos and disorder, like the Dark Ages, for example, or the bloody legacy of the first half of the 20th century. Or as I said earlier today, failed states and terrorist havens. But the lawlessness that Jesus pointed to at the world of the end will be exponentially worse than anything we have ever witnessed before. If you watch carefully what is happening today, and it's not just in Somalia and Afghanistan, what's happening today in our own country, there's an awful lot of this inversion going on. So we have to look at this world today in our own lives and try to find a point where we can put the stake down in the ground and say, this is the truth and we won't move from that. And Jesus said, as you get closer to the time when I come back, this is what it's gonna be like. People will say good is evil and evil is good and they will glory in their shame. Society is moving ever closer to the world of the end and we feel the currents of the tribulation blowing backward into our own cultures. As never before, we need to be able to articulate biblical positions on moral issues without confusing or reversing right and wrong. And as never before, we need to understand that the growing insanity in our world isn't primarily a political or a military problem. It's a spiritual problem. The further our world strays from Christ, the closer it drifts toward cruelty and chaos and wickedness. And Jesus said it will increase. You put God out of the schools, you put prayer out of the schools, and then you wonder why the schools are being shot up. Wherever you take God away, wherever you take Jesus away, wherever you push him to the perimeter, you leave a vacuum, and that vacuum is always filled, not with good, but with evil. And Jesus said, that's what's going to happen. He's not telling that to us because he wants it to happen, because he knows it's going to happen. And then the Bible says, when this wickedness increases, love will grow cold. That's an interesting thing. The growing wickedness will cause the love of many to grow cold. The NIV version of this particular verse says it this way, the love of most will grow cold. And that phrase is a translation of the Greek word psycho, P-S-Y-C-H-O. The word from which we get our word psyche and psychology. I want you to notice, here in Matthew 24, 12, the word is literally used in the sense of blowing air across something. Think of your coffee when it's too hot to drink. What do you do? You blow on it, allowing the air to stir the top of the liquid, cooling it just a bit. That's the word Matthew used. As the winds of lawlessness blow across our world, it chills our love, and the world becomes a colder place. That's what's happening. If you need more evidence, think of the loneliness and lostness of multitudes of people around us. A recent study concluded that 36% of all Americans experience serious loneliness. This includes a whopping 61% of young adults. 61% of our young adults are lonely. Look at the rise of diseases of despair. Over recent decades, including addiction, anxiety, depression, suicide, and more, all of these are skyrocketing in America and across the world. In fact, the medical journal BMJ recently conducted a review of health insurance claims between 2009 and 2018, and they found a 68% increase in diseases of despair on a broad level during that time. And that was before COVID, and COVID has spiked them. So this is what Jesus is telling us the world will be like. And we know he was telling the truth because we live in that world. And I may have pushed the limits a little bit today to get your attention, but every one of you know I'm telling the truth. This is the way it is. And I try to make this as clear as I can so that what I'm about to tell you will mean the most that it can. What do we do about people who are lawless and loveless? Well, the first thing I want to say, don't be that way. Don't be lawless and don't be loveless. That's a pretty good start. It's difficult to watch the world disconnect from God, isn't it? Humanity's slide toward lawlessness and lovelessness is painful. 
We feel a jolt when forces corrupt the institutions and customs we've cherished for so long. The darkness seems to be deepening over our culture like the edge of night. But we are not powerless. You, we are children of God. We're without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And in this generation, we shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life. One of the biggest ways we can make a difference is by bringing back a revolutionary concept called kindness, which in many ways is the antidote to lawlessness. We have limited ability to control the lawlessness and lovelessness in our society, but we can control how we respond to it. Remember, I told you at the beginning of the series that some people pray, Lord, change the circumstances so I can feel better. And the Lord says, no, I'm going to use the circumstances to make you be better. And I think that's what's happening to us now. I know that as I see these things happening in the world, and I see them as you do, I don't feel so much anger about it, but I feel, Lord, how can I be the person I ought to be in the midst of this? Everybody is looking for hope, and we have the hope of Christ. We need to turn our candles up higher and shine brighter. We live in a dark world, but we are here on purpose. God could have put us down in any generation he wanted to, but he plopped us down in this one. In this particular generation, it seems to be coming unglued, and we're the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world, but before he went back to heaven, he pointed to us and he said, you are the light of the world. So before we can ever be purveyors of kindness, we have to embrace it ourselves. So let me ask you this question. Do you embrace the kindness of God toward you? God said, I'm going to love my children. How shall I tell them? I know what I'll do. I'll send them my only son to die for them so that they won't misunderstand the depth of my love. I know many people who listen to me today who've been jolted by life and you've never had the human love you needed. Many in my generation growing up had that situation with our parents. It wasn't that they didn't love us, they just didn't know how to say it or didn't think it was right to say it. And if you don't have love from your parents, especially if it's the father in the family, the father in the family is the, he's the metaphor for your heavenly father. If my human father doesn't express love to me, how do I know my heavenly father loves me? And that kind of works in your soul. To all of you here today, God loves you like you cannot imagine. Maybe you wonder if somebody else loves you. Maybe you wondered if God loves you, but I'm here to tell you on the authority of the Bible, God loves you. He always has. He always will. He isn't just about love. He is love, and that love extends to you. So before you can ever express love to anybody else on behalf of God, you have to accept that God loves you. You cannot give to somebody what you don't have. On a practical level, men and women, our sense of God's love deepens as we spend time with him. And many of you know what I'm saying. You've had moments when you've been reading the Bible or listening to a worship song or just praying and you can almost reach out and touch the Lord. It feels like he's right there. Now, let me ask you this question. Does God get closer to us at one time than he is at another? No, he's omnipresent. It's that we feel his love. It's the things that happen to us in our life that cause us to be sensitive to what's already there. God loves you. He actually loves you more than you can imagine. And maybe you don't realize it, but when you go through stress, if you're a believer and you're in the word of God and you know the Holy Spirit is in control of your life, the things you experience will make you aware of what's already true. You are loved by Almighty God. He loves you desperately. And because that's true, because you are embracing God's kindness, now you can express it. Now you can share that kindness with others. When we embrace God's love, it becomes natural to express it. In many ways, kindness is God's love expressed through action. Nothing is more obvious in the Bible than God's command to love the world in tangible ways, such as providing a cup of cold water in Jesus' name to the thirsty. The leaders of Bear Creek Community Church in Lodi, California, took on the task of expressing God's kindness. 
They felt a burden to help provide safe water to impoverished parts of the world. The project wasn't in the church's budget, and so many of the congregation's families were already under financial strain. So who took up the challenge? The children's ministry did. There's a strong recycling emphasis in California, and the children began collecting bottles and cans to bring with them to church. Other congregations started to rally to the cause, and would you believe it, so far they've raised almost a million dollars for clean water projects around the world. And Michael Mantle described this wonderful news. He said, Jesus turned water into wine. The kids at Bear Creek turned garbage into water. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about us being channels of the love of God. We, we aren't supposed to just get love from God and store it. We're not a reservoir. We're a channel. God loves us, and he wants to love the world through us. He wants his love to come through us, and we become his hands and his feet and his eyes and his hugs to the people around us. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out. Everywhere you go, in your neighborhood, among your friends, if you just say, Lord, today help me to see the needs of people that I might be able to help, and he will show you, and you will have a list you won't be able to keep up with. The fact of the matter is, over the years, we have trained ourselves to blind ourselves to the needs around us, to live in our own little world, to pull the moat up in our house when we go home at night, and not to see what's going on. And today, in our world more than ever before, there are people who are just waiting for someone to share with them. Because you see, people don't care how much we know until they know how much we care. And when you help them with their physical need, they will listen to you when you try to help them with their spiritual need. The Bible teaches us that these things that are happening are happening not to make us feel better, but to make us be better. And I don't know about you, I have a passion in my heart. I want to be better. I want to be better for God. I want to know him better. So embrace God's kindness in your heart, express his kindness, and then embody it. How do we pour out kindness in a world that's defined by lawlessness? There's no better solution than just to be known as a kind person, a gracious person, a loving person. What if you and I were to reflect God's love to such a degree that the world around us said, oh, you know that guy? Oh my goodness, you should meet him. He's the kindest person I ever met. Oh, you know her? Oh my, I'll tell you, if, if you go near her and you whisper that you got something wrong in your life, she'll be at your house with something to help you. I mean, she's just the kindest, most loving person you ever met. Don't you just kind of in your heart wish you could be like that? I mean, people are going to talk about you anyway. Why don't you figure out how they can talk about you <laughs> and, and talk about you in a good way, right? Give them something good to talk about. In a world frozen from lawlessness and the lack of love, you and I have the opportunity to radiate spiritual warmth that comes with the gospel, the warmth of community, the warmth of kindness, the warmth of fellowship, the warmth of intimacy with our creator. We may not be able to control what's happening in our world. We wish we could, but we can't. I can't do anything about the lawlessness that's in our country right now. I, have no, I don't have that kind of power, but I do have power over me by the Spirit of God. And I can use what I see around me that's so wrong to ask God to make me so right, to make me the kind of person that people will say, he's kind, he's gracious, he cares. There's something different about that person. And then the Bible says that as we do that as a church, we become like a city on a hill. We must never forget what God has called us to do. When he sets before us an agenda, we must follow it. We must do Many followers of Christ are really surprised to discover that when they become Christians, their old nature doesn't go away. Maybe you're among those who think when you got saved, your old nature was eradicated. But if you believe that, ask your spouse. <laughs> How many of you know that we become Christians, but we still struggle with sin because we used to have just an old nature, and we couldn't do anything but sin. 
But when we became Christians, we got the Holy Spirit, and we now have a new nature, and we have two natures within us. We still carry the desire often to sin, which is necessary for us to fight against. We have to work against the things that Satan wants to do to destroy us. And uh, there's a wonderful little poem that I've quoted many times over the years of my ministry that more than anything else helps me to understand it. Here's how it goes. Two natures beat within my breast. The one is foul. The one is blessed. The one I love, the one I hate, and the one I feed will dominate. Isn't that interesting? The nature that you feed. So Paul is saying, if you're a Christian, you still have the old nature and you need to put off the darkness. You know, there's no such thing as darkness. Did you know that? Darkness is just the description of the absence of light. When light comes, darkness goes away. In Romans 13, 11 through 14, there is a signature passage. And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the world of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Using terse, blunt words, Paul offered four keys to help us live our lives in this time with urgency and not get caught up in the seductiveness of our generation, but remain close to Christ, walking with him. Let me give you those four things. First of all, he says, watch vigilantly, Romans 13, 11. And do this, he said, knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. If you had read that in the Bible, you would discover that there are five references to time. Knowing the time, now is the high time. Our salvation is nearer. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. It has always been important to understand the times. The Bible tells us we should be interested in what's going on. We should look forward to what the Bible says is going to happen. You hear the Lord Jesus scolding his critics, and he says to them, You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you can't discern the signs of the times. Jesus said, you're great weather people, but not very good prophecy people. In other words, they watched for the rain or for the setting of the sun, but they didn't watch for any spiritual signals. Today's technology lets us consult seven-day forecasts with reasonable accuracy. Doctors can predict that certain diseases may occur even before they manifest themselves. But all the while, we are remarkably blind to the workings of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We're hypnotized by the rhythm of life as if this moment has no bearing on eternity and everything is going to continue to be the same as it always has been. We need to get aware of what's going on and don't just say, yeah, prophecy's good, Jesus is coming back someday, so let's get on. Uh, What what ball game are we going to watch tonight, you know? Some people laugh at the very thought of the Bible predicting the future. The scoffers who would come in the last day saying, where's the coming of the Lord? Since from the beginning, people have been talking about the coming of the Lord and he hasn't come yet. No matter what others may ever think, no matter what theologians may write, no matter how much the skeptics doubt, ladies and gentlemen, the return of Christ to this earth is certain. It is going to happen. I can't tell you when. I'm not even going to attempt to do that. Not only is the Lord's coming certain, but according to Paul, it is eminent. And do this, he wrote, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Listen to those words. When I use the word eminent, I am not using a calendar word. I am not setting a date for the Lord's return. Eminence does not mean immediate. It simply means that something could happen at any moment and that nothing has to occur before that moment takes place. If we understand the proper meaning of that word, we will realize that the coming of Christ could have been just as eminent in the first century as it is today. As we learn from the pronouns that the men used, they thought Jesus was coming in their lifetime. 
Now, the way Paul expressed this truth about our Lord's return in this passage causes some confusion. Did you hear the verse? For now, our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. If you want a good answer for those who ask you when the Lord's coming back, there it is. Somebody said, you know when Jesus is coming back? Yeah, I do. It's sooner than when I first believed. He's coming back sooner than when I became a Christian. You will always be right if you say that. You don't have to worry about anybody contradicting you. That's a perfect answer. But what did Paul mean when he said our salvation is nearer than when we believed? I mean, after all, isn't our salvation in the past? When Paul uses the word salvation here, he was seeing that concept in its completeness, in its fullness. For instance, the moment we say yes to Christ, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit and our sins are washed away and we are saved. The next thing that happens is we begin to grow and be conformed spiritual molecule by spiritual molecule to the image of Christ. We become more like Christ. We are being sanctified. That's what that means, to be made holy. And then ultimately, when we stand before the Lord someday, we'll be made perfect and set free of every sin. Here's a good way to remember this. There's three tenses to salvation. Listen carefully. Past, I have been saved from the penalty of sin. Present, I am being saved from the power of sin. Future, I will be saved from the very presence of sin. <laughs> salvation, past, present, and future. I have been saved from the penalty of sin. I am being saved from the power of sin. Sanctification teaches us how to be victorious in our life. But ultimately, one day when I stand before the Lord, there will be no sin in heaven. There will be no presence of sin. I will be saved from the presence of sin. And my salvation at that moment will be complete when Jesus takes me to himself. Now, Paul is saying that that part of our salvation, when we are freed from the very presence of sin, when we stand in the presence of the Lord, that part of our salvation is nearer than when we believe. He was saying he's coming back and his coming is nearer than when you became a Christian. I mean, that might not mean anything to you, but it tells us this is a moving target. We don't know when it is. I think I'm going to be around when it happens. I hope you are. I tell everybody I'm looking for the upper taker, not the undertaker, right? <laughs> Aren't you? Uh, yeah. I think we all agree about that. We, we, yeah, we vote for the rapture, right? <laughs> the whole purpose of the rapture is to inject into our spirit a sense of urgency to take it seriously. This is not just about knowing more about what's going to happen in the future. It's knowing what's going to happen in the future so we can get our act together now, so we can start living with a little more concern about what's going to happen. We are to watch vigilantly. And then the Bible says we're to war valiantly. Verse 12, I know watching can feel like a relatively passive thing, like watching paint dry. But Paul had other plans and other priorities in mind for his followers. He said, listen to this, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. What are you saying is, listen, this stuff is going to happen we've been talking about, but don't get caught up out there. Remember, what that's teaching us is we've got to make some changes now. We've got to look at our own lives and realize if Jesus came back tomorrow, what would you have to do today to be sure you wouldn't get embarrassed when he showed up? First of all, Paul told the Romans to put off darkness. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Cast off the works of darkness. When Paul tells us to put off darkness, he chose a decisive verb. It means to deliberately, purposefully, significantly, and permanently put aside the things of darkness. Now, I don't know if you've ever discovered this, but darkness is a term used often in Scripture to describe the life that we lived before Christ came into our lives. Ephesians 5.8, for instance, says this, For you were once darkness... But now you are light in the Lord, so walk as children of light. How many of you know that we become Christians, but we still struggle with sin because we used to have just an old nature and we couldn't do anything but sin. But when we became Christians, we got the Holy Spirit and we now have a new nature 
and we have two natures within us. We still carry the desire often to sin, which is necessary for us to fight against. We have to work against the things that Satan wants to do to destroy us. And uh, there's a wonderful little poem that I've quoted many times over the years of my ministry that more than anything else helps me to understand it. Here's how it goes. Two natures beat within my breast. The one is foul. The one is blessed. The one I love, the one I hate, and the one I feed will dominate. Isn't that interesting? The nature that you feed. So Paul is saying, if you're a Christian, you still have the old nature and you need to put off the darkness. You know, there's no such thing as darkness. Did you know that? Darkness is just the description of the absence of light. When light comes, darkness goes away. And then that helps us to understand his next comment. He says, put off the darkness and put on the light. Paul's second command is even more positive. When we are told to put on the light, he is using the New Testament picture for walking in fellowship with Jesus. John said, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Because Jesus is coming back, get off your hands, quit being so cautious and take some chances for the Lord. Ask some people if they know Jesus. We're to watch vigilantly, he's coming back. We're to war valiantly against the evil in our system and live in the light, not in the darkness. Here's the third thing, we're to walk virtuously. Let us walk properly, verse 13 says, as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. And I hate to tell you this, but these words were addressed to Christians. He's not writing this to pagans. He's writing this to the Roman Christians. And he's saying to them, don't do these six things. These six listed sins here fall into two categories. The first three have to do with public disgrace. And the last three have to do with sins that can hide in the human heart before they are manifest in the light of day. All of them are understood to be sins of the night and opposed to what you are as a Christian. The things that he lists in this paragraph have no place in the life of a Christian. What fellowship does light have with darkness? None. And we can't, we can't make an impact on this dark world if we're as dark as the world is. And so you gotta win them to something, amen? So, 1 Thessalonians 5, 5, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, he said, you are all sons of light and sons of the day, we are not of the night. We are not of the darkness. We are not. We're of the light. So reject public sins. Reject revelry and drunkenness and lewdness. There used to be a day when if you were a Christian, it meant something. I know there's a whole issue about lists of things, the dirty dozen, the terrible 10, nasty nine, all the things you're not supposed to do, you know? I grew up in a kind of environment where that was true. But we've swung the pendulum clear to the other end. We're not against anything anymore. You can be in many churches and just live like you never changed a thing when you became a Christian. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible calls us to holiness. It calls us to a certain way to walk, a certain way to live. We're not only to reject public sins, but we're to renounce the private ones as well. And then Paul says to these Christians, watch vigilantly, war valiantly, walk virtuously, and wait victoriously. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. You can't have confidence if you're always making concessions to the enemy. Oh, well, they won't understand. Well, that's all right. They don't have to understand. You know what we've learned as Christians over the years? My children went to secular schools. David played football at a secular junior college. And my son Daniel played in secular schools. And they were always the brunt of criticism. But you know what? When the people who criticized them got in any kind of trouble, those were the first people they wanted to talk to. Isn't that interesting? When they see that you've got the guts to live a different kind of life and you don't party like everybody else and you just stand up and be who you are and don't be ashamed. 
Walk with God. Walk with honesty. Walk in integrity. So listen, listen to how Paul concludes this lesson. He says, put on Christ. He tells us that we're to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you do that? What does it mean to put on Christ? Every day when you get up, you put him on. You say, today, Lord, you and I are going into this dark world, and we're going to make a difference with the people we are around. We're going to show people the influence of Jesus Christ. Amen. And then I love this one, because this is so practical. We are to make no provision for the flesh. That means we're not to allow ourselves any possibility to gratify our desires. Believers who have been saved out of addictive lifestyles should weigh carefully Paul's words here. The strategy for victory is to avoid the situations that enabled your addiction. Don't put yourself in places where you'll be tempted. Be ruthless in putting those old habits to death. Do it pointedly, do it piteously, and do it permanently. Do not plan for sin. Don't give it any welcome. Don't offer it any opportunity. Kick the sin off your doorstep and it won't get in your house. Amen. There's an old saying that goes like this, call upon God and roll away from the rocks. The idea is to put yourself in the best situation to succeed and move as far away as possible from the place of failure. Now I want to tell you a story. I remember one time as a little boy, we used to go to a cottage when I was living in Toledo, Ohio, in a place called Petoskey, Michigan. There was a woman up there who had a beautiful home. We'd go up there. And one day, uh, I was up there with my parents. The rest of the family went someplace, I think to the grocery store, and my mother said to me, whatever you do, David, you stay away from the lake. I don't want you messing around down with the lake. I don't want you down there when nobody's here, so don't go near the water. So guess what I did? I went down and I was kind of looking, I think I was trying to catch some fish off the dock, and I fell in. And before I could get back to the cabin, my parents returned, and my mom was furious. She said, what in the world are you doing? And she told me, I said, it was an accident. She said, well, you got a swimming suit on. What do you mean it's an accident? <laughs> <laughs> and she told me, I said to her, well, I just took the swimming suit in case I got tempted. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Don't put yourself in a place to be tempted. That's what Paul is saying. If you want to make a difference, if you realize Jesus is coming back and you don't want to be embarrassed when he comes back, live your life in such a way that you will be proud to meet him when he comes because you'll be walking in the light. I read a book about habits and this isn't even a Christian, but listen to this. This is pretty, pretty close to scriptural truth. He said, every environment promotes some behaviors and prevents others. The key is to be in an environment that supports the results you want to achieve. The people who surround us fill our days with little cues and triggers that can make our habits easier to follow or harder to build. Are you fighting your environment to make change happen? Or does your environment make your new behavior effortless? If you're struggling with something that's getting you, even as a Christian, and you're finding you're not living victoriously and you're letting the devil get an advantage, maybe you should change your environment. Maybe you should get with different people. If you're with people who do the things you used to do and you're trying not to do them, you are playing a game you can't win. The influence of so many peers on you will destroy you. Don't set yourself up by failure by staying in an environment that encourages you to do wrong. You get in an environment, you find friends, small groups are a part of that, that encourage you to do right and help you lift up your spirit and lift up your life. I'll never forget the first time I saw the film, The Passion of the Christ. We sat and watched a bloody, gory, graphic depiction of everything Jesus endured for our sake. My own prayer was, and I'll never forget it, was this. Lord, help me to live my life from this moment onward in such a way that I never do anything to hurt you or break your heart, not after what you've done for me. That should be something of our prayer. That's the power of the cross. When we become Christians, Christ comes to live in us, and we learn to be uncomfortable with everything that grieves him. Just knowing, really knowing that Christ lives in you is the greatest motivation toward godliness that you ever have. So in many ways, that knowing is the key to victory, and spiritual challenge pale beneath that core. 
The epic war movie Saving Private Ryan tells the story of a rescue mission centering on young Private James Ryan during World War II. Most of you have seen it. When a senior official in Washington, D.C. learns that three of James' brothers were killed in action, he orders a special mission to bring the young man home to his mother, the last of her sons. Unfortunately, James' unit is missing in action somewhere in France, so Captain John Miller is tasked with assembling a squad and finding Private Ryan, a mission he accomplishes. But when young Private Ryan refuses to abandon his soldiers, Captain Miller and his squad are forced to defend him in the middle of a terrible battle against the enemy. James Ryan survives this battle, but Captain Miller and most of his squad are killed. At the end of the film, a mortally wounded Captain Miller pulls the stunned private forward and says with his final breath, James, you earn this. You earn it with your life. And the scene flashes forward to the present where James Francis Ryan, now in his 80s, is paying homage to Captain Miller's grave at Omaha Beach in Normandy. Overcome with emotion, perhaps some guilt, James speaks to the grave marker as if he's addressing Captain Miller and the rest, and he says, I hope I've earned what all of you have done for me. Of course, no one could ever merit such a great sacrifice, no matter what they did. Nobody could earn it. Thankfully, no gift is ever earned, especially the gift of eternal life. That's the truth about salvation. We cannot earn our salvation either before or after. There's nothing you could ever do to pay God back for the sacrifice he made for you through the death of his son. But here's what the Bible says. In Ephesians 4.1, it says, live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Live a life that's worthy of what Jesus did on the cross. Think often of